Good evening to all of you. I'm not going to be talking to you about my book because the book is for you to buy and read it. <laughs> buy not for my benefit because everything is going to charity. So I just wanted to make that known to all of you. But more importantly, it's so nice to be here at the request of the Observer Research Foundation. This is the second time I'm coming here to share my thoughts with all of you, more importantly, which uh, Dr. Mehrotra and I really believe in, namely, subject of skilling India's millions, which is essentially an imperative to India's global success. The other thing, when she introduced me, even knowing Madhu Kannan is sitting here, who is the CEO and MD of BSC, you didn't say I'm the chairman of BSC. So I want to. <laughs> Otherwise, he'll think we are ignoring him. Now, what is, if you take the year 2020, the average Indian will be only 29 years old, compared with 37 years for the average Chinese and American. And the average age would be 45 in West Europe and about 48 in Japan. We are talking about the year 2020. So what it means is India is the youngest nation and we would have the largest workforce. So this is what we have to keep at the back of our mind. Again, by 2020, it's estimated there will be a shortfall of about 56 million skilled workers on a global basis, while India will have 47 million excess at that time. So one is a shortage in the Western economies and a surplus in India. So there seems to be a natural fit between India's demographic dividend and the world's shortfall. So there is a potential opportunity for India to become the talent pool for the world. And the late Professor C.K. Prahalad, one of the India's uh, greatest minds, when posed with this problem, came up with a vision for India at 75. And he said we would need to skill 500 million Indians by year 2022 to meet the needs of our industry as well as capitalize on the global opportunity. When I say industry, it's not just the traditional industry because an organized sector contributes a lot of employment. However, this is a pure number talk. Unless our children are educated, unskilled and no English, which will help them integrate into the larger world. So they have to be skilled, they have to be educated. Now consider a simple example. Suppose you export a certain amount of iron ore and you say earn a thousand rupees or a million rupees or whatever. Now let's say the same iron ore is made into steel and exported. Suddenly the value addition and the price at which you can sell becomes the value addition and enables you to command more. That's the point we need to keep at the back of our mind. Similarly, an Indian who is more skilled will suddenly earn more. All of us are seeing in our own lives. And a chauffeur, a driver, will earn more than a mere driver because of the professionalism that he will bring to the job. If we train him properly, skill him properly. A chauffeur trained in world-class manner can find a job anywhere in the world. So you keep extending this thinking. The point I'm making is that our training and skill development must be world-class so that our youth are good enough for the global market and that way the standards here also become very different. And the IT industry is a very classic standing example of the success that can be ours provided you have people trained to global standards. That's how we are respected in every part of the world. That brings us to the bigger challenge in our country, over 200 million go to primary school. Of this, 39 million reach the level of secondary school. So the dropout you can see from the primary to the secondary. Of this, 15 million complete higher education and 22 million get into vocational education. So at each stage of the education ladder, we have essentially a 50% dropout. That means that we are losing a staggering 50% of our potential workforce, which is a very huge number. That means, where do they go? 
perhaps to low-skilled jobs like your neighborhood Chaiwala, or work in farms and sometimes just on the streets, venting their frustration. You and me essentially represent a very small fragment of India's elite. That is the other India that resides in our villages. For them, the full benefits of development has to yet reach, and they seem to be stuck in the time capsule of years ago. So for them, we need a more inclusive model of growth. That's what, when we keep talking about inclusion, this is the point I'm trying to make. The poor do not lack capability, but they certainly lack an opportunity to make something of themselves. We are seeing several government initiatives that are addressing this issue of equity of opportunity, the Right to Education Act, self-help groups, all of these are in that direction, and these will over time make a difference in empowering our youth. Much of our effort today goes into solving the problems of the rich, while the best minds to solve the problems of the poor is what we need. 93% of our workforce is in unorganized sector, that's another statistics, with no formal training. Even, even so, their contribution to the economy is considerable. Imagine the productivity if they had the benefit of a training or a skilling. So I strongly believe that if we concentrate our efforts in reforming the rural poor, focusing innovation on the challenges in our villages, we'll be able to leverage the opportunity to become the talent house of the world. For this, we need some disruptions because we cannot do it by the conventional methods. First and foremost, we need disruptive thinking. If you ask young people in rural India what they aspire for, honestly, they will say they want to learn English, earn a degree. Some of them will say they will become or wish to become engineers and doctors. So the question is, are we limiting our choices? Obviously, there's a need to spread awareness about the opportunities that are available as far as work goes. Chasing degrees, even when the degree may not end up in a job, is sometimes a waste of time. So you would agree that not all children can be rocket scientists. Some are good with their hands, good at creating things, good at fixing things. Others are inclined to more professional studies like engineering. So it's a cross-section of disciplines, cross-section of skills. We need world-class plumbers, top-class welders, well-mannered chauffeurs, trained domestics, and healthcare workers. These are some examples of what they can do. There's a need to respect these skills and provide opportunities for upward mobility so that people can see these as stepping stones to further success. Today's world offers alternate routes to success. Does anyone care if Sachin Tendulkar is not even a graduate? If you excel in what you do, whether you are an electrician or a plumber or a retail store assistant, you can move up the ladder. Today's world rewards professionalism and this message that must be spread across rural India and our small towns so that people take pride in whatever they do and do it well. It's the passion to do something, pride to do things the right way and excel in that. As an example, handmade products sell at a premium in Western markets. However, in India, our weavers and artisans in rural India who can be compared with the best in the world cannot earn a living from their trade. All they need is connecting them to the right markets, giving them inputs to what the trends and taste of the markets, bringing in professionalism into their functioning, which will go a long way in fetching them a better compensation and restoring, more importantly, their respect. This is when I say disruption in the thinking. Second, we need disruption in the education system, and I'm sure Dr. Mehrathra will be able to throw a lot of highlight on this. And vocational education must be seen as another option for upward mobility. The government will soon be coming out with a policy framework that will enable school students to choose vocational subjects, earn credits, and later join the mainstream education. It will, I am certain, generate more interest in school and essentially decrease the dropout rates. Such innovations in what we learn and how we learn will be a huge game changer in the job market. The work of the Tata Institute of Social Sciences is greatly respected. However, they find that to grow, they need more people interested in social research. There is a big shortfall in that area. Why should science and engineering or MBA have such a coveted position in society? Our educational system must encourage the study of humanities, 
of literature, of yoga, development studies, and a wide range of subjects which have a great relevance today. Today, teaching yoga is a paying profession. If you have a degree in design, you are very much in demand in product companies. The rural sector needs could include study of modern agricultural methods, horticulture studies, and dairy farming as an example. So the landscape essentially has changed, and our education system must adapt to it. This is the second point I wanted to make. The third disruption is in the delivery of training. When we think of a school, our mind brings up an image of a building, teachers, and a playground. This is what we think when somebody tells you, what is a school? If all the 220 million children in India need to be educated, then we will need to build thousands of new schools, employ millions of teachers, both an impossible task. Here is an alternate thought. Any space which can bring the teacher and the student together can essentially become a potential school. Every village has a post office. Can post offices double up as places of learning? Any competent person with a skill or a knowledge can become a teacher. These are not crazy ideas because NGOs like Akanksha have proved that they work. Did you know that the Indian railways have the largest broadband facilities in India? So can their facilities be used to deliver distance learning? You may have heard of the Rural Broadband Project, which aims to bring last mile connectivity to 250,000 panchayats across India in the next couple of years. We are looking at using this opportunity to experiment with skilling the youth. Can we teach communication skills, computer literacy, courses in tube well repair, mobile repair, etc., through this medium at the rural level? If this works, we will bring training to where the youth are instead of the youth coming to the brick and mortar type of institutions. That brings me to another disruption, namely the unconventional job models. Our challenges are unique and we need hybrid solutions to address them. Traditional methods of jobs and job profiles need re rethinking. Let me give you an example to illustrate what I am saying. For poor villagers, access to cheap and timely health care is a distance dream due to shortage of doctors and health care staff. A hybrid model working well in pockets of India is the concept of barefoot doctors. Training youth or women in the fundamentals of healthcare, various types of diseases, their symptoms and cure, and adding a spell of practical training is helping create the first line of medical help in villages. Common diseases like diarrhea, fever, jaundice, and malaria stage a speedy recovery because of timely treatment, while complex cases can be referred to the nearby hospitals. If we went the conventional way of training full-fledged doctors and nurses, it will essentially take a lifetime. Again, 41% of India is unbanked. That is, they do not have bank accounts. In a move towards financial inclusions, banks are adopting the concept of business associates. These are essentially people who visit rural households equipped with handheld devices which connect to the banks. People can make small transactions via the device and advice of the bank representative. This model brings the bank to the people's doorstep. The business associate idea is being further explored as a means to deliver other services such as insurance, etc. These are unique and un unconventional models that are creating new jobs and new services to the poor. I must add here that the peripheral benefit is the creation of rural entrepreneurs. In fact, entrepreneurship itself is a powerful model for rural development because they are lacking in provision of basic services. So these are just a few of the innovations and disruptions that rural India needs and also the urban poor need, and I could go on about them. I have not even touched upon the problems of migration and how do you credit funding for the poor. Quite clearly, the potential is still to be fully exploited in our country. The skill ecosystem, like I said, is pretty complicated. It involves people and age-old mindsets. Then there are the archaic laws that need a relook. And it involves the education system. It involves faculty and curriculum development. And more importantly, it's all about social inclusion. Any solution essentially must address three parameters. One is it must offer scale because of the size and scale of the population. It must be replicable. And thirdly, it must include robust monitoring and mechanisms using technology because unless we see what is happening on the ground, we are not going to see the benefits. So we are trying to look at it as advisor to the prime minister in some of these dimensions 
For instance, by giving access to funds, more poor people will be encouraged to skill themselves by working towards credit funding being enabled for vocational training. Third, almost half of India lives in UP, Bihar, MP, Rajasthan, West Bengal and Varissa. So India's demographic surplus will mostly come from these states. They have large rural population and their literacy level of 64 to 70% is lower than the national average of 74%. Focusing on skills related to agriculture like dairy, modern agricultural practices, agro-processing, animal husbandry, horticulture will generate local employment by leveraging their native intelligence and knowledge. Another approach has been to focus on certain sectors that offer scale and a huge demand for people, construction, manufacturing, tourism and hospitality, healthcare, IT, IT enabled services are amongst them. For instance, construction industry demand estimates show a requirement of over 35 million between the year 2012 and 2022. We are also looking at models across the world, such as community colleges in the US and Canada, German, Swiss, Australian, vocational education, Singaporeans. These models are highly inclusive and demand driven because in countries like Germany, Switzerland, over 60% of the young people who enter the job market, they enter through the vocational training stream as apprentices. And the system enables lateral and upward mobility. And I met several of the CEOs who began as an apprentice. Another thing we need to keep in mind is that it's not just for the economic benefit that India needs to skill its people. We must do it because peace and prosperity is a natural outcome. When people have jobs, food on their table, a sense of security, and a life of dignity. No country in the world faces such a skill development challenge as us, and we have no precedent to use as a reference. We therefore need to devise our own strategies, be willing to experiment, and be bold enough to try new and innovative solutions. Some of these will certainly fail, but these failures will be a part of our national learning. Earlier this year, we have seen nations in the Middle East erupting into violence led by their youth who feel a sense of despair about their future. Closer to home, the anti-corruption movement has shown the power of mass movements. There is a lesson for all of us. On an optimistic note, we are on the brink of opportunity and we must make a difference in the next 15 to 20 years to take advantage of the situation. There is always much discussion on what is India's biggest challenge Many say it is infrastructure, but I would agree with them only to the extent that yes, infrastructure is top of the agenda, but not of the material kind, but of the people kind. I would put education and skilling right on the top because skilling people is the infrastructure we need to create a bright future. Thank you.